Welcome to the CJK Fire and Safety Education Podcast. CJK Fire and Safety is a specialist consultancy based in Far North Queensland, Australia. Specialising in fire safety, the business director and accredited fire safety engineer, Christina Noor, acts as a special expert witness in legal cases across the nation. This includes developing litigation compliant reports and being engaged for court cases within the construction stream of the legal industry. Join us at CJK Fire and Safety Education, where we discuss hot topics regarding fire safety in Australia. My name is Emily Knox. And my name is Jasmine Matthews. Buckle in as we discuss all there is to know about the 2014 Melbourne Lacrosse Fire case liability and appeal. To begin with, let's talk about the fire. Jean-Francois Gubiata was a French backpacker in Australia on a working holiday. He had moved into apartment 805 of the 23-storey Lacrosse apartment tower at 673 to 675 La Trobe Street, Melbourne, about three weeks earlier. He lived in this two-bedroom apartment on level eight with five other people. That's six people in a two-bedroom apartment. An investigation conducted after the fire found that a number of the two-bedroom apartments had six to eight beds and the balconies were being used for the storage of items like mattresses, cupboards and other furniture. They also found that smoke alarms in many of the multiple occupied apartments, including this one, were disengaged, covered or disconnected. On Monday the 24th of November 2014, Mr Gubita returned home from work and went out onto the balcony to check if his clothes were dry and to have a smoke. He butted his cigarette out in the plastic container they used as an ashtray on top of a timber-topped outdoor table. Although he said he heard a psh sound because there was water, the cigarette did not go out. The fire then spread from the container to the table to the air conditioning unit and a cardboard box on top of it. It then spread to the cladding on the external facade of the building. The flame degraded the aluminium sheet and exposed the highly flammable polyethylene core. From here, it travelled up the vertical wall to the balconies above. Embers and fire residue also fell down onto the balcony below. At 2.23am, a smoke detector in the hallway outside the apartment's front door activated and sent an automatic alarm to the fire brigade. When the first fire crew arrived on scene at 2.29am, the fire was racing up the cladding on the external wall and had spread onto the balcony on each level. It was already up to level 14. Six minutes later, the fire had reached the roof of the building. The rapid fire spread compromised the emergency warning and intercommunication system, so fire crews had to enter every level of the tower and alert occupants of each apartment to ensure total evacuation. Approximately 450 to 500 people from 304 apartments required immediate evacuation and emergency accommodation. Fortunately, there were no fatalities or serious injuries, which is a testament to the first responders and the sprinkler system. The fire resulted in more than $12 million in damages. So let's dig into the background of this case, starting with the building timeline and contracts. The Lacrosse project commenced in 2007 when the Gardner Group was engaged by the developer to provide regulatory advice and building surveying services. The architect, Ellenberg Fraser, was involved from the earlier stages of the project, being engaged by the developer in June 2007. In that same year, fire engineer Thomas Nicholas was engaged to provide fire safety engineering services. The Gardner Group's initial fee proposal governed their project roles and responsibilities until the Gardner Group consultant agreement with the builder, L.U. Simon, was signed in 2010. This meant they were contracted by L.U. Simon to ensure that the design and materials used in the construction of the building complied with the BCA. In 2010, Ellenberg Fraser and Thomas Nicholas also signed consultant agreements that largely followed the same terms as the Gardner Group, making them liable to L.U. Simon. These agreements meant that all three parties were liable to L.U. Simon. In 2007, Ellenberg Fraser proposed designs using ACPs on the east and west facades of the tower as external cladding. What are ACPs, you ask? Aluminium composite panels, or ACPs, consist of two aluminium sheets with a polyethylene core. They were originally designed for signage. They are durable, versatile, lightweight, 
and can contribute to energy efficiency and weatherproofing. They also can make a building look great. In 2008, Thomas Nicholas sent out his preliminary draft fire engineering design brief. And in this document, it noted that external sprinkler protection to overhang and balconies are not required. The brief did not take into account the east and west facades, and it was claimed that they were not identified as a deemed to satisfy deviation. He had argued that the brief was only based on what was included in the Gardner's Group Summary of Fire Engineering Issues. Although this brief was described as a preliminary draft, no final version was ever produced. In reference to the general structure of the building, the external cladding was referred to as a precast panel wall system. The fire engineering report, FER, sent in March contained a fire suppression system table that stated, unless otherwise noted, external areas, for example, balconies, eaves and overhangs, which compromise non-combustible construction, need not be sprinkled. The FER referred to composite wall cladding, silver aluminium composite sheet, No versions of the FER referenced ACPs and no one in the design team ever raised any questions about this. In April 2008, Ellenberg Fraser issued the T2 specification, which later formed part of the design for the Stage 7 building permit, which included composite metal panel wall and soffit cladding systems indicative to a Luca bond. Then, in 2009, the project stalled due to the global financial crisis. So in August, the developer instructed Ellenberg Fraser to split the project into two stages. The East Tower was to be built in Stage 1 and the West to be constructed in Stage 2. L.U. Simon provided tenders for Stage 1. Then, in May 2010, Property Development Solutions was formally retained to provide project management and superintendent services, and L.U. Simon was awarded the design and construct contract. As mentioned earlier, it was at this time in 2010 that each of the three parties signed consultant agreements, making them liable to L.U. Simon. In February 2011, Thomas Nicholas contacted the Metropolitan Fire and Emergency Services Board, the MFB, with the Regulation 309 application and architectural drawings. Although the drawings referred to aluminium composite sheets, the report only said precast panel wall systems. The MFB report carries this incomplete description of the facade over. The report also required that essential safety measures for the Rocross building were to include a condition that apartment balconies are not to be used for storage. In May 2011, L.U. Simon sent Ellenberg Fraser a sample of a Lucabest ACP. The project architect checked out the colour of the sample, then asked L.U. Simon for confirmation that the ACP met the warranty and other requirements of the specification. L.U. Simon contacted the manufacturer, then replied that Alucabest's warranty terms are 15 years in accordance with the specifications and head contract. The architect took this, meaning that the Alucabest ACP met the warranty and other requirements of the T2 specification and signed off on the sample. The design had actually said for a Luca bond, but the fact that a Luca best was used instead of a Luca bond turned out to be irrelevant, as both were combustible ACPs due to their 100% polyethylene core. In June 2011, Gardner Group issued the Stage 7 building permit signed by Mr Galanos. Through 2011 and 2012, L.U. Simon constructed the tower with the ACP panels as per the Ellenberg Fraser design, as they were obligated to do so under the terms of the DNC contract. Mr. Galanos undertook the final inspection of the building and issued the occupancy permit on the 14th of June 2012. Two years later, the fire occurred. The owners, who were not involved in the building and the approval process, obviously did not want to pay for the damages to their building. So, they took the builder to court. The case. The case was brought by the Lacrosse building owners against the builder, L.U. Simon. The hearing was at the Victorian Ad- Civil and Administrative Tribunal and presided over his honour, Judge Woodward. The owner's corporation was made up of 211 applicants. Their claim against L.U. Simon was straightforward. They argued that L.U. Simon breached the warranties implied into the DNC contract by the Domestic Buildings Contracts Act, and he was liable to pay damages. 
One of these warranties was that all materials to be supplied by the builder for use in the work will be good and suitable for the purpose for which it was used. They went on to say that if L.U. Simon was successful in shifting liability to the other parties, namely Gardner Group, Ellenberg Fraser and Thomas Nicholas, then those parties would be liable to the owners. Then began the blame game as the surveyor, architect and fire engineer each in turn tried to shift liability back to L.U. Simon, relying on principles of proportionate liability. They alleged that L.U. Simon failed to take reasonable care in selecting and installing the Alcabest panels They further alleged in substance that L.U. Simon should bear the majority share of any responsibility for the damages suffered by the owners. Let's talk about Thomas Nicholas, the fire engineer. The court found that Thomas Nicholas played the most important role in the Lacoste project because they were the primary consultant responsible for fire safety compliance under the Building Code of Australia. Thomas Nicholas argued their FER stated that the external walls needed to be constructed of non-combustible materials and that its fire engineering assessment didn't include identifying the use of ACPs. The court said Mr Nicholas should have warned others that the ACPs proposed did not comply with the DTS provisions of the BCA. Mr Nicholas claimed the warning wouldn't have made any difference as none of the key players would have read the FER anyway. However, The L.U. Simon director said he had looked through the FER for things that were important to him as a builder. There was no comment about ACPs in the report. Therefore, he assumed that they must have been code compliant. The judge noted that the statement in the FER regarding the deletion of sprinklers on the balconies was due to Thomas Nicholas's lack of attention to the significance of the ACPs. Therefore, while in isolation, the statement was not a breach of the consultant agreement, his failure to assess and advise on the implications of the use of combustible ACPs was in breach of the agreement. The court did not accept that Thomas Nicholas had recognised the ACPs did not comply by simply making a passing reference in the FER. If they were fulfilling their contractual obligations, they would have, as a minimum, included it in the FER as a matter requiring an alternative solution or raise it in discussions with at least the Gardner Group, or both. This would have meant that the Gardner Group did not issue the Stage 7 building permit, and L.U. Simon would not have constructed the La Crosse Tower, incorporating the ACPs as specified by Ellenberg Fraser. The next player is the building surveyor, Mr. Galanos and the Gardner Group. Mr. Galanos argued that he had issued the building permit on the basis of the product, not a component of that product. He said... I formed the view that the use of a composite metal panel wall and software cladding system manufactured by a Luca bond as external cladding for the building and as specified in the drawings referred to above was BCA compliant. I relied on section C1.12F of the BCA, which I considered deemed a bonded laminated material non-combustible. L.U. Simon's claims against the Gardner Group include issuing the Stage 7 building permit with the ACPs in the design, failing to identify deficiencies in the FER, and failing to inspect the building during construction. L.U. Simon also argued that the Gardner Group was liable for not adding that the apartment balconies are not to be used for storage in the essential safety measures in the occupancy permit. But it was found that there was no evidence to say that the cardboard boxes contributed to the ignition and subsequent spread of the fire. And lastly, we have the architect, Ellenberg Fraser. Ellenberg Fraser tried to focus attention on L.U. Simon's design responsibilities under its DNC contract. Ellenberg Fraser initially specified the non compliant ACPs in the T2 specification and architectural drawings and never tried to correct this. They also failed to check whether the sample of Alcabest ACP actually complied with the BCA and was fit for purpose. In his witness statement to the court, Mr Fraser claimed that once the builder was in charge, the builder was really taking on the role of the lead coordinator dealing with consultants and in managing the design. After L.U. Simon came on board, he felt he was no longer able to act as the head design consultant. Both Ellenberg Fraser and Gardner Group claimed to have believed that the material was non-combustible and therefore raised no concerns. 
The court agreed with the owner's submission that the Eleucabus panels were obviously not good or suitable for the purpose of being used on the external walls of a high-rise residential building. The judge found that although L.U. Simon had breached the warranties implied into the DNC contract by Sections 8, B, C and F of the Domestic Buildings Contracts Act, they did not fail to exercise reasonable care. L.U. Simon was wholly responsible and liable. The tribunal ordered L.U. Simon to pay a total of $5,748,233.28 to the owners. This was to cover the reinstatement works and additional insurance premiums. Further sums of around $6.8 million for compliance costs, removal and replacement of unburnt cladding, loss of rent and alternative accommodation claims are yet to be divided. After establishing that L.U. Simon was liable to the owners, the judge allowed L.U. Simon to pass its liability onto the consultants on account of their failure to fulfil their obligations with reasonable care. No evidence was given that the builder did not act reasonably or in accordance with what would be expected of a reasonably competent builder in the circumstances of the case. This effectively absolved the builder of any blame by distributing the cost amongst the consultant team. While L.U. Simon was liable to pay damages for the owners, these damages were to be reimbursed by the other respondents. And so the three contractors, the building surveyor, fire engineer and architect were all held to have breached their consultancy agreements with the developer by failing to exercise due care and skill. The judge held that, in my view, Thomas Nicholas sits at the top of that hierarchy by a clear margin. As I have said, Thomas Nicholas was the only building professional involved with knowledge that the ACPs were non-compliant and a fire risk. I have also found that it had both sufficient knowledge of the design and experience in the industry to have recognised that the ACPs proposed were likely to t- contain polyethylene. It was therefore uniquely placed to raise the red flag on the use of the ACPs, and it could have done so by the simple expedite of an email, question or comment at a design meeting or by identifying in the fifth FER that the ACPs required assessment as an alternative solution. So, what were the findings? Thomas Nicholas was found to have breached their consultant agreement and did not exercise due care and skill by failing to conduct a full fire engineering assessment and failing to include the results of that assessment in the FER, failing to recognise that the ACPs didn't comply with the BCA and failing to warn L.U. Simon and the other parties of this. Gardner Group breached its consultant agreement and did not exercise due care and skill by issuing the building permit for Stage 7, approving the Ellenberg Fraser specification of ACPs and failing to notice and query the incomplete cladding description given by Thomas Nicholas in the FER. Ellenberg Fraser breached its consultant agreement and did not exercise due care and skill by failing to remedy defects in its design that caused it to be non-compliant with the BCA and not fit for purpose and failing to ensure that the builder's substitution of a Lucabest ACP samples were compliant. The judge distributed the damages payable as 39% to Thomas Nicholas, 33% to Gardner Group, and 25% to Ellenberg Fraser. What about the guy who actually started the fire? Mr. Gubita owed a duty of care to the owners. However, his responsibility was confined to the balcony of apartment 805. He was allocated 3%. However, no orders were made against him and L.U. Simon was not reimbursed for his proportion. And now the appeal. In July 2019 and again in July 2020, the owners sent a Calderbank offer to each of the applicants for leave to appeal, in which they offered that each application be discontinued on the basis that each party bear its own cost. Neither were accepted. In July 2020, L.U. Simon sent a letter to each of the applicants for leave to appeal, offering to pay the applicants a 10% contribution towards the damages awarded in favour of the owners, a 10% reduction in the amount the applicants had been ordered to pay the owners and a 10% reduction in the cost they had been ordered to pay L.U. Simon. Ellenberg Fraser and Thomas Nicholas sought to accept the offer, but Gardner Group did not. So, on the 26th of March 2021, in separate applications, all three parties appealed the decision. 
The court rejected all of the grounds of appeal by all three parties, excluding one of the grounds of appeal by the Gardner Group. This resulted in the damages payable to LU Simon to the owners being redistributed as 30% to Gardner Group, a small win at 3% less the original share, unchanged in relation to Ellenberg Fraser, and 42% to Thomas Nicholas, which was 3% more than the original share. This case has highlighted the importance of contracts and liability. In Australia, there are still many buildings that were constructed with ACP cladding, and so these cladding litigation cases will not be ending anytime soon. That's all for today. We hope you will join us for the next CJK Fire and Safety podcast. CJK Fire and Safety hosts a range of educational resources on fire safety and engineering topics, explained in an easy and understandable way. We invite you to enrol in our interactive online courses. All courses have a completion certificate and may contribute to your continuing professional development points. Visit our website at cjkfireandsafety.com.au to learn more.